I love you. Hi ho, the Dario. Harry Pooper 5 for me. <laughs> Welcome back, Couch Potatoes. I am the Green Traveler. And I am the Faceless Leon. This is a podcast about movies and TV. Welcome back, Harry Potter 5. The Order of the Phoenix. The Phoenix. <laughs> I'm hooked on Phoenix! <laughs> yeah, here we are with the, the fifth movie, the, the longest book and the second shortest movie. How they pulled that off? Well, by cutting everything, of course. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> everything. But uh, we found we finally found a director. Uh, we're, we're sticking to it now. We've got David Yates. He has replaced all of our replacements. And he's replaced <laughs> them in such a way that he's going to do all of the rest of the movies and the god-awful Fantastic Beast films. Love it. Thank you, David Yates. He was chosen because he did, uh, like, television shows. Maybe it was, like, small television pieces, like, you know, mm. not not major things. But the way he told stories and handled them in a, uh, handled the political backstories without being heavy-handed impressed the producers, I guess. So they're just like, I yeah, see. we'll give it to this. We'll give it to this guy who's done nothing. You can't, yeah, he can't be heavy-handed in Harry Potter. And if we're being honest, this is the most political one. It could have been more. I would argue it probably could have been more heavy handed. Maybe have another half an hour so that it actually makes sense. I don't know. I, I mean, it hasn't even been that long since I watched it. Like when you watch the movie, you finish the movie. It's like, oh, man, a lot of things happen. And then you're like, wait, what happened? <laughs> it's just kind of it kind of goes by in a blur yeah i every time i watch this movie i can't i can't really hardly remember what happens it's kind of ridiculous honestly but like it's not even it's also not written by steve cloves it's the only harry potter film not written by steve cloves actually i don't know if huh. he did the the fantastic beast but he did harry potter one through four and six through eight like huh. the only one i wonder what why yeah and they're like, okay, we tried. Come back. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he had to be a writing something else. Like, I think he was just working on another project. Yeah, but, like, how, how you, I don't know. I won't get into it because I don't know the facts. But, mm -hmm. yeah, this is, it's written by Michael Goldenberg. And it seems like he just relied a lot on montages. And it's, you know, it's just, so, there's so many montages in this movie. And, yeah. You know my feelings about montages. I don't right. think I've really told the audience. Uh, th there's a good way to do a montage. If you're going to have boring shit that that needs to happen to advance the story, but you know yeah. it's going to be boring to watch, there's a montage, i.e. Rocky. You know, it's, it's, it's entertaining to see him train, but to see him do the same shit every single day would get boring in the film. Yeah. So instead, we have an awesome freaking montage where he runs around philadelphia hell yes that makes sense the montages in this movie they don't even present necessary information <laughs> <laughs> it's just... yeah so yeah you're talking about like when the, especially when she's hanging up the new ordinance around yeah. the school that's like dropped into three different montages or something like that yeah, it's ridiculous, and it's just like, the whole thing is, yeah, you know, we forgot how to use David Bradley Baker as Argus Filch. Be funny, you know, <laughs> be, yeah. be the comedic relief, and, you know, he comes in and does all the funny things, like he's standing on a way too tall ladder and hammering an, an ordinance into the wall, and with each swing, the ladder, like, shakes, like, almost to the yeah. point it's gonna fall, and you're just like, no. <laughs> I mean, I gotta say... Great physical comedy on his part. Oh, he's yeah, he's fucking genius. Joy, I enjoy it. I just don't know. Yeah, like like you said, I'm not. I don't think it's necessary. There's other ways to use the character. I'm sure he has some role in this book. Uh, not really. She kind of forgot about him too in the books. It feels like there's oh, okay. there's so one. It's, it's Rowling's fault. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Like it's just that she had so many characters that she didn't want to. Right you know explore so much she wasn't a george r, r. martin she's more you know just a jk rowling she has a thousand characters <laughs> and five of them get really well developed and the rest are just there for eye candy and he's one of them that like there's a, there's one moment i can't remember which book it is i want to say it's the second book but harry is he, he he 
catches Harry doing something wrong and he pulls him into his office to to eke out a detention and while Harry's there he finds out that Argus Filch is a squib which was, uh, we've oh, talked yeah. about before is the uh, a, basically a muggle born to wizarding parents I mean he's he's a wizard he just has no connection to magic right. and Harry discovers that and it's it's a nice little character moment where you, you get a little remorse and sympathy for Argus Filch and why he is the way he is mm-hmm. and you know that's one of the many aspects of these films that's just kind of like eh fuck it he's just a comedic relief character yeah, it's like yeah. they they, they kind of gave him some beautiful moments in the second film, but um, yeah, yeah, he did seem a little bit more like a character in the second film, and I'll have to keep you know keep, try to keep more attention on him coming up in these next films. You get less and less of actual Hogwarts as you go on, but I would be interested to see to because I have not rewatched those last two movies. I don't think I have so. Not. I I would be uh, curious to. To see <clears throat> how he's treated in in those big moments later on, but I have to tell you, I'm still kind of stuck on uh, eye candy for her characters because I'm thinking, would it be more like imagination candy? But then also, like you do read it, so you use your eyes to read it. So maybe it is eye candy. I'm just well, I was just kind of stuck on that. Yeah, it's their description on on the page is literal eye candy. And then I the imagination is mind's eye candy. Man, mind's eye candy, okay. Pulling it out my ass today. <laughs> here we are with uh, the odor of the phoenix. Ooh, stinky. <laughs> yeah, it came out in 2007. And yeah, it's Harry's fifth year at Hogwarts. Uh, he goes yeah. back after... Uh, he, he goes back after a little heat with the ministry uh, right. to save... He and his cousin Dudley and the absolute dumbest opener to any Harry Potter film get attacked by a Dementor. And, you know, to ward off the Dementors, Harry uses magic, which is a big no-no. No, Harry, no. Well, he needed to. It, it was self Yes, <laughs> exactly. He needed to. And he, he gets called into trial because apparently students practicing underage wizard or magic outside of school is such a huge event that we have to call all these judges and jurors and everything and it's it's just a clear clear cover up for what's really going on is harry you know in the last movie harry came back from the tri wizard tournament and was like hey everybody voldemort's alive oh no and <laughs> the ministry absolutely refuses to believe that yeah, and they're doing everything they can to slander Harry's name and Dumbledore's name since Dumbledore's backing him fully. So that's why they called the trials because it's just like, can we get him suspended? Can we ruin his name so that people stop believing that the devil is alive? Right. And then uh, once he does get back to Hogwarts, we once again, as always, have our new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, Dolores Umbridge. Dolores Umbridge, thank you. She is a member of the ministry, and we'll say for the purposes of this synopsis, is keeping an eye on Dumbledore and slowly taking control of the school for the head of the ministry, Cornelius Fudge. Indeed. And uh, that brings me to a new segment on the show. (laughs) The Doctor Who Corner. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I wasn't even going to try to do the turn stuff. Uh, I don't even know if that was any good. Welcome to the Doctor Who Corner, because Dolores Umbridge is played by Imelda Staunton, I believe. Uh, I didn't write down to make sure that, that she is Dolores Umbridge, but I'm fairly certain it's Imelda Staunton. And Imelda Staunton does the voice of The Interface and The Girl Who Waited, a Amy Pond episode for, uh, for right. the Smith era. Yeah. So that was a fun fact that I, uh, yeah. one of the new faces of Harry Potter yet again in <laughs> Doctor Who. Uh, and she's not the only new face in, in Doctor Who. Uh, we also meet Draco Malfoy's mother, Narcissa. Oh. Narcissa Malfoy, who's played by Helen McCrory. And uh, Helen McCrory was originally supposed to play Bellatrix for Strange, but oh. she got pregnant. And oh. I, guess she turn, I guess she turned down the role because, you know, she didn't want to do a role that was more action heavy so she became narcissa malfoy instead 
very small part. Wow. Movie, well, really. yes, an interesting part though, nonetheless. Uh, especially later on. Yeah, and she plays she plays the queen of the. Uh, I don't know if you remember. There's there's this one episode. I think it's David Tennant era, where there's aquatic vampire women in in Italy. Yes. Yeah. Does she play the countess lady? She's the queen of the vampires, I think. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. She's good in that. I just watched that not that long ago. Really? Is it? Is it a David Tennant episode? Can't remember if it's him. Uh, no, that's a Matt. That's that's the first episode where uh, Rory is in the TARDIS with Matt. Oh, Smith fabulous! Yeah, one hundred percent my favorite companion, Rory. Yeah, Rory's good. It's been the Doctor Who corner. <laughs> It's like a, it's like a mixture wow. of uh, like w- waves crashing and uh, a whale. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure how to pronounce to how to make all those noises at the same time. But anyways, the TARDIS has left the building. Yeah, there's a glorious soul out there who can do that that sound. <laughs> yeah, perfectly. And he's yeah. the one who records it every single time. Like they, they're like, we want <laughs> yeah. it to sound just a little bit different each time. Yeah, so, give the TARDIS a little personality. Today it's sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, fuck. Well, shit. Yeah. Harry's being practically tortured by the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, Dolores Umbridge. Yeah. She's basically trying to butt Dumbledore out of the picture and take over the castle for Cornelius Fudge, trying to cut off this, this feed of bad news. Because you right. know, just like recent governments, this the government of Harry Potter really just doesn't want to believe in reality. <laughs> just, oh my god! And it calls every and it calls everything they hate false news. You know, it's just like yeah. Voldemort's not alive. That's false news. How dare you? Meanwhile, Voldemort's out there actually doing shit and wrecking right. havoc and right building an army. Yeah, there's definitely a parallel there, but a reverse parallel. Like, reality happened after the movie. <laughs> Sad. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think the biggest point of the movie is uh, Dolores Umbridge refuses to teach Defense Against the Dark Arts. Right, and yeah. She just that, textbooks teaches them. Horrible way of teaching. And because of that, Harry decides, through the help of friends, I'm going to be the motherfucker who teaches these people how to defend themselves. And right that's, that's really the the meat and the potatoes as we've said before of this film it's harry harry coming to as as a teacher himself as a right a defender a, a accepting that he is himself a good wizard like he's not he's not on the same level as these other kids so he is from a very technical standpoint their superior yeah so him taking it and taking that professorship role with them was really interesting to see because he's like i am just a kid but i have the experience and they don't and they need it and you get these like beautiful moments of like humble brag with harry where you know it's just like he he uh everybody's just like you're so good and he's like no i'm not I'm, i'm just really lucky you know every time i go out there it's luck and it's just like dude you have to accept that you are actually a good wizard. Like this yeah, is kind of that movie yeah. where he finally starts to slowly accept that maybe I am a badass. You know, maybe I am a luck. badass. Let's go fuck up some Horcruxes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, before we before we deep dive into the synopsis, like, what are your thoughts with this film? What are my thoughts? Um, well, you know, I think the story is interesting. Uh, I think it was, you know, a good place to go off of where, you know, we left off in the last movie. But I don't feel like it was executed the best it could be. I think like I was I was watching it the whole time, you know, like I never like felt like I needed to drift away my interest. But it was close. It was close to sometimes. And I think the montages are a part of that. I'm not as sensitive to that as you are, but. I definitely did come into play. It's like instant rage for me is when it's just like, <laughs> doo, 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 here's the musical score. And now we're going to skip two hours of film. And I'm just like, but that, I, I wanted to see that. Like that looks yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't they do, do the cool thing? Uh, yeah. Uh, I it really just, uh, after you're done with the movie, you're like, man, damn, 
that was pretty but wait a minute was it good i don't know you know like because like especially in those last moments of the movie you are on the edge of your seat watching this shit happen but at the end of it you really just don't know what what happened and i think i already said that yeah. feels like there's a lot missing and yeah and i'm sure you're going to tell me all about that once we get behind a wall here again i'm not the biggest harry potter nerd but this is one of my favorite books i think i think it's ron vald that's called his least favorite book or maybe it's his least <laughs> favorite movie it, it's just because the characters are so whiny because they're all going through puberty and it's oh. just like, he just fucking hates that <laughs> it's just like it's so annoying and, and I can agree with him, you know, as a, as a kid, it didn't feel annoying, but when I go back to read it, I'm just like, oh my god, just fucking walk up the show and tell her your goddamn feelings, like, yeah. Jesus Christ. It, it, it's just very teenager book, and a teenager movie, like, there's this awkward yeah. confrontation scene with Seamus, where, where they're, like, yeah. both, like, both yelling at each other in front of the kids. My mom said... <laughs> <laughs> My mom said this, and he's like, "Well, your mom's a big dumb duty head." And then it's like, Why are you? <laughs> "Oh, come and on, which wizard like, fight right now?" And then Ron stands up and he's like, "I'm Ronnie the Bear. I'm bigger than fuck, <laughs> both of you, motherfuckers. Now shut the hell up." I'm a sick scabbers oh on God. you. I'm a sick him. Oh, and I don't have him anymore. Oh no! Oh. <laughs> I'm so the sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit but yeah it's, it's very teenager and like as you said it has yeah. that, like false third act thrill that it's just like there's so much that happens in that third act that you're just like whoa yeah and you walk away like that was great and then you sit yeah. there and think it's like but what happened for the first hour and a half <laughs> yeah it's like all i remember yeah. is that uh, epic wizard battle that was just upon rewatching is just silly but it seems like all of the really juicy and cool information was hidden behind doors and yeah. they never opened the doors. And that was very annoying to me. Dude, you you just set up a great segue to a big difference in the books. And yeah. I mean, we might just have to put a, up the spoiler wall just to go ahead and deep dive into the film. And I'll just Let's start with Let's do it. That. Let's fucking build that wall. Salutations. If you wish to skip the spoilers, head to 4024. Have a good day. But ink dink But in the books... <laughs> They go to when they go to the Ministry of the Magic at the very end to go exploring uh, to go save Sirius Black because Harry has a false vision that Sirius is in yeah. danger. In the book, when they go to the Ministry of Magic, they go to the the Department of Mysteries, which is where they're you know they're summoned to. And the Department of Ministries, when they walk in there, it's just like it's a room of doors, and the doors revolve. In the books, I think it's like a circular room, and there's like eight doors or ten doors, and and the room revolves, and all the doors change. So they have to like oh. magically mark what doors they go through. But when they go through the doors, there's so much crazy shit. You know, there's that there's a I think there's one where it's like they fall all the way to the bottom, and then it just like immediately stops them, which is in the movie. That like that one scene like where they they right. fall but before they hit the ground they like stop in the air and they're like Ugh. I hardly remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's another room where there's just like a bunch of vats of brain creatures. Like oh. I think it's just brains, but like the brains are alive and I think they have like like what the fuck wizards. Yeah, they they just have all these weird mysteries, but it's like as you said, they there's like there's a bunch of doors and they just don't open them. They don't discuss that at all. That whole Department oh, of Mis Ministries is just glass balls, and that's it. It's just like all these weird prophecies. Yeah. I did think that was interesting, though, but the, that is not in the book, or that's that, not how that it is. That room is, yeah, that room is one of those rooms behind the doors. That's what they're they're looking for, that room, and they, they discover all these other weird rooms that all come into play in the final war because it's just like as the kid they're trying to run away from voldemort's death eaters they're you know they're they're all just kind of chased into these different rooms and they kind of have to use the environment of that room to beat the death eater or they themselves wow. get uh encumbered in those rooms it's it's a crazy war at the end in the books like i love it in the movies, it's just a bunch of whispery wind where the people are apparating back and forth, and it looks weird. Right. And it's like their face, their face is in the wind, and it's just like this like yeah. foamy tail kind of 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 cloud. 
And it's, I don't know, it's just so stupid. I hate how they show apparating in this. That does remind me of one difference from this movie to the last movie. And that's the Cyrus, Sirius, excuse me, speaking through the flame. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, in the fourth movie, like, it's the coals, like, morph and make his face. And I thought that was cool. And now it's just, like, his face is projected on the flame. I was like, that seems so lazy. <laughs> I actually hate both of these. Uh, both of their interpretations of the face and the flame. Sure. But I hate this one more because they changed it. Because that last one, yeah, it looks gross, in my opinion. Like, it doesn't look good at all. But it made sense. But it looked like magic. It looked like... It looked like a magical spell to make the embers look like someone's face. Exactly. And like and I can imagine them putting their head in there and like pushing it forth through the ashes. Like I can imagine that yeah. the magic behind it, like you said. And and this one it just looks like a you know, a face green screened over a flame and yeah. it looks really stupid. Yeah. It's just like why guys? But eventually he ends up at Sirius Black's house. And this is before before he goes to Hogwarts. And they're trying to listen and, you know, fucking Fred and George, they're allowed to do magic outside of school now. And, uh, but, and they like, one of them uses this trick where he drops his ear attached to. He didn't drop his ear. They, yeah, they made, they made ears. Yeah. That, that was pretty funny. Um, but they're trying to eavesdrop. And I feel like they don't hear any of the important information that's being given in that room. No. Anything. They hear they hear just the basics. You know, just to yeah. get an idea of what's going on. But right before right before they start giving out like important details, Hermione's cat comes up and just tears the ear off yeah. the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny, but uh yeah. I really want to know what's going on behind that door. I imagine that there was a lot more in the book. Especially because in the subsequent scene, Sirius is like, Harry has a right to know, and then tells him a whole bunch of shit. There's honestly not. They they, they kind of deliver no. all the important information. You don't really get much of what's going on in the order outside right. of what these kids hear. Because, you know, watching it back, it's really hard to understand why the order doesn't just let these kids in. Because it's like, they're played by 18-year-olds in the movie. Right, in right. The, in the book, they're 15, you know, so it's like, I, I can kind of get it. But at the same time, they're 15-year-olds who have gone through some serious shit. Right, like, yeah. They're going to be curious about, like, the, it's not like they're 10 years old and they're going to go and, and play something uh, yeah. and be distracted. They they know that some fucked up shit's going on in the world. They sh It just does seem kind of weird that they're being left yeah. out. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I and, mean... It's I, probably for the secrecy aspect yeah. of it. Yeah, I get, I get. There, they are kids. They might let something slip that they're not supposed to. Or, I mean, also there is the argument that Harry will go. He seeks trouble. Like he, he will go out to find trouble. But it's like, I don't know. It, it I feel like just letting them into a lot of the, the mystery of what they're doing, right. would have been beneficial for them. So, because, um, yeah. let me ask this this next question for you. And I'm sorry that I'm just kind of asking you a bunch of questions, but this movie, like, it really is very confusing to me every time I watch it. This is probably, like, the third or fourth time, too. <sighs> what is and why the Order of the Phoenix? <laughs> <laughs> so, let me put on my nerd glasses here and straighten them out. All right, all right. <clears throat> uh, so... The Order of the Phoenix, way back in the first Wizarding War, when Voldemort was attacking shit, they were just a group of, you know, really talented witches and wizards who were fighting back. They were, you know, most of them were Aurors from the Ministry, people who fought uh, Dark Wizards. You know, I think, honestly, I feel like most of them just worked in the Ministry, except Harry, you know, Harry's parents didn't work. They were just god-awful rich. Like, I think it's mentioned yeah. that James, James Potter is so famous, or so rich he literally did not ever have to work a day in his life. He was just kind of a spoiled brat. What did he do? His parents were rich. It's just it built off oh, of oh. family fortune. Po yeah. So Potter is a fairly old wizard family, probably. Uh, yeah, I have no idea, honestly. I mean, his mom was uh, a mudblood, which feels wrong to say. I'm so sorry. 
but <laughs> yeah you could just say born of muggle parents god that's six syllables compared to two <laughs> we ain't got that time on this show i have to ramble for an hour and a half this if, I go how... like... <laughs> if i'm using longer words we're screwed <laughs> this is how it happens is it's a you know it first you get apologetic about it and then eventually somebody else hears you and they don't care they're like he said it i could say it <laughs> yeah, you're right all right his mom was born of muggle parents <laughs> so, so you know there might be there might be good ancient blood in, of wizards in it in the potter family i have no idea i don't remember how i got there from the, from all this <laughs> um uh, the order of the phoenix right yeah every, most yeah. of them worked in the ministry but i mean obviously harry's dad didn't i don't know if uh, his mom had a job but they were just they were just this big group of people that were fighting fighting back that you know trying to match voldemort's army with dumbledore's army and he, i don't know why they weren't just like militarized by the ministry i don't know how the wizarding world works but for this movie because the ministry is so adamantly opposed to believing Voldemort is back and believing that there is a threat, the Order of the Phoenix has to operate secretly. They have to do everything, you know, quietly behind closed doors. Uh, Sirius's house is off the map, literally. Uh, like, there's one person who knows the location of it, and because of that, that person can allow people to come in. You know, it's it's really. I mean, it's not explored in the movies, but it's just like this. This is epic spell that's. You know, the, the mm. Potters used it, and the only person who knew the location of the Potter's house was Sirius. But then he told Peter Pettigrew, and Peter Pettigrew immediately went and told Voldemort. They just thought that was a better idea. They thought that Voldemort would expect Sirius Black to know the answer, but he wouldn't expect Peter Pettigrew. Little did they know Peter Pettigrew was the yeah. fucking spy. Yeah. Unfortunate. But that's how it goes, you know? That's life. But the Order of Phoenix here, they have to operate quietly... Uh, Snape is a, a spy on multiple fronts. You know, he's a spy for the Order operating as a Death Eater for Voldemort, who thinks that he is a spy for Voldemort operating as a, you know, as a spy on the Order of the Phoenix. So it's like, you know, there's so many articles and like fan love for Snape, but, and we'll get to him near the end, but this is one of those movies where right. you finally start realizing the turmoil he's in. Because you, you get a little taste in the movie, you get more of a taste in the books, but you get a taste in the movie just what he has to do to keep information from the Dark Lord. Right, um, yeah. How, how to still his mind, how to fight mind. back in his mind in his training. Yeah. Harry, it's really pretty interesting. Like, yeah, you definitely get to know him a bit better in this film. But I wanted more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they don't. I, they don't do that until the seventh book, eighth movie, <laughs> maybe. Seventh I, there's movie? some. The sixth book is pretty good. Oh yeah, it's very Snape forward too. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, here you get a tiny little glimpse into his his backstory, which you get a lot more of in the books, like a lot more of. You see more scenes. You see him with Lily, uh, Lily Potter, who at the time was Lily Evans, because she was a right. young girl when they met. Yeah, you get a lot of his backstory in this, and it's really well done. It sets up how Harry's father was more of an asshole jock than Harry realized. You know, Harry's always idolized his father, and this is the movie that it's like, you can still idolize him, but dude had some bad qualities <laughs> when he was young. You know, like any person can. And in, the, and in this movie, you have one bully scene with him that kind of shows how much of a an ass he was in high school. Right, uh, to, to Snape in particular. Yeah, because there's like that, that flashback scene where they he, he holds Snape up magically. He holds him upside down in the air, and he's just like, I'm going to take his pants off in front of all these girls. Ha 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 ha. I am richer than you. <laughs> fucking billionaires <laughs> so what else what else should we talk about or did we did we talk about it i don't know another quality that's missing is uh dobby has a huger role in the movie or in the books than he does in the movie most of his actions were given to other characters kind of like the last film you meet creature though who was also right. 
almost gonna be cut from the movie david yates was like had him on the cutting room floor and jk rowling's like uh no he's kind of famous in the finale and you're gonna want to set him up now so they just they just tossed him in there real quick with some unneeded scenes that really did nothing yeah for the movie. they did nothing for the movie except for to show that sirius has a house elf that was all yeah. they did yeah they really don't do the house wells any justice in the in the movies I mean, it just goes, it, it's just the wizarding way, man. Fuck the house elves. That's how it goes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Harry goes back to Hogwarts. Harry Harry starts, everybody's kind of upset under Dolores Umbridge. Harry's on edge all the fucking time because, you know, half the school believes him, half of it doesn't, and they're all militant against him, kind of. Right. And, you know, he's, he's going through puberty. He's, he's he's in love with Cho Chang, but he doesn't know how to tell her that because all she wants to do is cry over Cedric Diggory because she liked him and he's dead and she's going through a grieving process. But Harry's just like, fuck it, I gotta I gotta love her. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah, just just move on, Harry. She's she's dead on oh, that was not the right turn of phrase. Um she likes, you know, Cedric and he's gone. <laughs> she's got to she's got to grieve and harry's harry's pushing in real yeah. fast and there's so many moments in this movie where you'll catch jenny looking at harry looking at cho and it, it like there's a moment where they all meet in a inn or in a, a pub i mean at at hogsmeade and it's like it's the first gathering of their defense group that that harry's going to be teaching which they call dumbledore's army and when they're walking away from that, though, Hermione's like, well, one thing was for sure. Cho couldn't take her eyes off you, could she, Harry? And then, like, she, they all run away. And, like, you just see Jenny just looking at us like, that bitch. <laughs> like, Jenny looks, <laughs> she looks so pissed in that scene. It's so funny. Hey, you know what, though? I have to say I'm glad that they yeah. included that, given where their relationship goes. But it's yeah. too missable. It's too easily missable like at, by the end of this series i did not yeah. see it like but i didn't read the books so i'm sure if you've read the books ahead of time no nope. no it kind of come out of the blue in the books too that's another one that's again i can't stress enough i have a tv show planned and i know what to focus on i made <laughs> notes i have story outlines like just get jk rowling out of the picture and hire me to do a tv show and i'm i got it just take me away i can do this but that's one of the things that right. i think needs to be severely focused on more if people are going to tell the story is harry's relationships not just with ron and hermione but with everyone around him and you could do that in a tv show you can have multiple well-developed relationships in a show atmosphere it's like i want to yeah. know how you know, I want to see him up in his frat room with Sh uh, Seamus, Dean, and, and Neville. You know, I want to see him hanging out with all of them and how they, right. what, you know, the fun they have. And, of course, I want him and Ron and Hermione, too. But the biggest one is him and Jenny. Also, like, the girls of Gryffindor can get better yeah, developed, too. because there's only, like, two of them that we know of <laughs> in the movies. Right. And then also, you know... Cho would be an actual character too. Yeah, yeah, they can build her up. They can build Cedric up in the earlier seasons because he just kind of appears out of the blue in the third book and right. then he's a big character in the fourth book. And All right, I didn't see Rob Pat in those other two movies. Those other three movies. He he is in the third movie, <laughs> but it's a different guy playing Cedric because they never called him that. Yeah. it's just some random seeker dude. It's the seeker the Hufflepuff dude. Hufflepuff seeker yeah. dude. That's how he's listed in the credits. I don't remember his name though. But yeah, D U D E. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's that's like the biggest thing. That's kind of, I mean, it's it's funny that they include that brief glimpse that Jenny's pissed about that. But they they should have gone into her more. Yeah. Like I really want more Jenny. Right. Yeah. I also want more Kingsley Shacklebolt. I believe his name is. He's the he's the black guy <laughs> in the order, like the only black guy in the movie. And oh yeah, yeah, he has that funny line with Dumbledore at the end. I don't remember what yeah, it was. The, the ministry closes in on Dumbledore, yeah. and they like they believe they've got him, and they're gonna arrest him. And it's like the minister of magic himself is there, but before they can move in on him, like right. Fox the Phoenix comes flying down, and Dumbledore claps his hands on his tail and just disappears. 
And everybody in the room's like, bro. Right. And then Kingsley's like, well, you have to admit, man's got style. <laughs> yes. <I love> it. <laughs> That's it. That's I the love one. Kingsley. Yeah. Like, oh, and, and again, shit. I, I, know, I know they cut what was unnecessary out of the movie, but man i wish he got more sure, development sure. He, he does a lot of fun in the in the books like i mean he's not a huge character in the books right but his character is fun all of those characters though all of those characters in the order they need yeah. more development they they're barely in the movie they it almost doesn't make sense to call it the order no. of the phoenix like you could have called the dumbledore's army and that would have Sense. I feel I feel like that that was her working title. Like I feel like it had to be. It could have been. That, I mean that that photograph of the original order though is what inspired all of my my second television show plan, which was the the first Wizarding War, where you actually focus on the Order of the Phoenix. You build them up. You know, so many people in that in that photo as as it, it's Sirius Black in the movie, but in the books it's Mad Eye Moody who shows him the photograph. And tells him the story of the original Order of the Phoenix. Huh. And and as that person points out, so many of those characters in that photo are dead now because of that first Wizarding War. They died in the yeah. war, or they show Neville Longbottom's parents and are like, they kind of went mad. Uh, the Cruciatus curse uh, yeah. constantly over and over again, and eventually they just broke mentally. Man, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry to, sorry to jump off on that one. That's another one is... Uh, another huge portion of the book that's left out is the hospital. Ron's dad gets attacked by a snake, and he he's you know he's sent to the hospital, and that happens in the movie. He gets attacked, but they kind of just cut from that to Harry learning ocument, oculumency, yeah, and then cut from there to Winter Holiday. Where Harry is, you know, back with with Arthur Weasley and Molly, and he's just like, "I'm back from the hospital, hooray!" And they cut wow. out the hospital, and I mean, not much happens at the hospital, but you get two developments on characters. You get another shot at uh, Gilderoy Lockhart, where he's, you know, he's at the hospital, still completely, still yeah, stupid. still still brain wiped, um, but he's he understands that people want his autograph, so he's like back to being fixated on himself but he doesn't remember who he is uh, so it's like it's fucking hilarious i love me if only i remembered if who only that I was knew who, what this girl at lockhart had done that everybody loved me for the other the other characters though is you get to see uh frank and alice longbottom neville's parents and neville's neville's visiting oh, wow. them and like i mean you you bear witness to the tragedy of the first wizarding war you see the toll it's taken not only on these two people who fought it and wow. lost their minds, but also on their child. Yeah, I think they could have done a better job throughout the series of, of Neville's yeah. character because there's spo- like I, I know there's supposed to be a big parallel between him and Harry, and that it, you know it could have very easily been yeah. him. I think that I I don't know I think they try to get it across in like the seventh movie. Yeah, yeah they might have tried sure. to it. Like in the movie. The, at near the end, there's a uh, heartwarming scene with, I mean, it's not really heartwarming. It's really sad, actually. Uh, scene with Dumbledore and Harry, where Dumbledore's telling Harry everything about like the last five years, and he's like, "Well, this is why I didn't tell you then. And I thought you were too young, and I still thought you were too young, but but right. now I realize I just gotta fucking tell you." <laughs> so yeah, Jeez, the, the, yeah, the whole MacGuffin of the movie is trying to find a prophecy. Voldemort wants to listen to this prophecy because he thinks it holds an answer that'll help right, him right. defeat uh, Harry and, you know, take over the world. And when Harry hears that prophecy, he learns that him and Voldemort basically can't be alive at the same time. One, you know, none, neither of them will have their their happiness as long as the other one's alive. One of them had to kill each other, the other one. And Dumbledore knew that because he was the one who the prophecy was told to. Uh, by professor trelawney which is fun fact <laughs> she's you know she's only <laughs> ever done two actual <laughs> prophecies in her whole life <laughs> <laughs> she's they both have to do with harry and in that in that epic one where she um says that neither can live while the other survives you know harry hears that 
and he, he hears the whole prophecy and there's like a line in there where it's like the child born near the end of July or something stupid like that. And Neville had Neville's birthday is also near there. And in the book in the book, Dumbledore mm-hmm. tells him Voldemort was looking for both the Potters and the Longbottoms because he didn't know which child the prophecy was about. He didn't know if it was about baby Neville oh, Longbottom yeah. or baby Harry Potter. And he just assumed based on just magical prowess in James Potter and Lily Potter, he just assumed they would be the ones to produce this prophecy. So that's why he that's why he focused mm. on them. Yeah, you know, he was he he also had it in his mind to kill Neville, but because he attacked Harry, he solidified the prophecy. Like it could have been Neville Longbottom who was the the chosen one. Yeah, who knows? Well, are you ready for closing statements? Or you got you got you got more you want to say about this movie? I mean, there's obviously I feel like more missing. I mean, how many pages you say this thing was? It was, it was a beast. A beast yeah, world. I think it was like eight hundred, maybe, maybe more, nine hundred. I'm honestly not sure. But no, I think yeah, I think most of the rest of the stuff I have is really just kind of trivial things. So yeah, I think I'm ready for a uh, closing statement. Yeah, let's do it. I suppose I'll go first. You know what? I really didn't think it was going to happen for this series, but I think I'm going to give this movie half oh, really? a face. Yeah, and you know, I don't really recommend it, but obviously if you're watching through the Harry Potter movies, you got to watch it to get what's going on in the sixth one, maybe. I don't know. I think the most important thing is something we didn't actually talk about behind the wall, so I guess I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> but... There's like, yeah, there's some important story elements. And as you watch it and you finish the movie, you're like, oh, wow, some interesting things happen. But when you reflect upon it, nothing substantial happens, at least not that is memorable. And like, I really like Dolores Umbridge and that kind of a villain. But this just this movie as a whole, the way it was done, it didn't work for me. So uh, that that didn't save it. And, you know, I think that like story wise, there's a lot of things that could work, but it just it just didn't. Like, I feel like they could have taken this same story with all the things that they left out and made a better movie. I, I, I don't I just don't understand. I uh, this is probably the harshest critique I've ever given. <laughs> um, but, you know, they it was it is like one of the biggest franchises though too of our life and they had so much fucking money to do this film and it's just not very good like it looks good like it doesn't look bad anyways like i said again that has that false third act thrill is what you called it so you can watch it it's watchable it's just at the end of it you're not you're not gonna know you're not gonna get it yeah it's i'm in agreement with you honestly it's it's just disappointing and it's and it sets up a lot of what i yeah. hate about the rest of this franchise and i i don't want to say it's all on whatever that the actors or the director's name is donald david yates i don't want to blame it all on david yates but he is the common denominator sure. in, the, in the next four movies he is <laughs> yeah that's true that's true they do all have a, a yeah. similar feel which you know with when you have a, a as the same director you're I mean, gonna get I, that. I do remember liking the next one i, I guess i shouldn't say that i yeah, do remember this liking one this one, one just does rub me the wrong way you know it has a lot of silly silly jokes or like silly one-liners like there's a moment where like hagrid and the gang's like looking out from the hut and there's a storm coming and hagrid's like there's a storm coming and it's just like you know he's not talking about the storm that's coming uh, he's talking about the the metaphorical storm of the war and it's just right. like come the fuck on like, right it, mask this better, please <laughs> like you know this this is first draft bull and uh, there's another you know there's that teenage scene that we talked about with Seamus and Harry that it's just like it, it, it feels very teenager and that's fine because they are going through puberty and everything but at the same time this is a little serious like <laughs> it's just, it, it feels so yeah. silly at times and Again, I do like Dolores Umbridge, amazingly portrayed by Imelda Staunton. But, yes. But again, yes. there's so much to her character, and they do. She's like one of the best parts of the movie, honestly. Yeah. I but would there say comes so. a moment where it's just kind of like, all right, 
uh, we've tricked her, and now she's gone from the movie. You know, she's like she wasn't the main, she wasn't the big bad. Yeah, no, she wasn't the big bad, even though she was mostly focused yeah, just on sub boss. But I mean, and that is something that I meant to talk about behind the wall, but I'm not really too worried about it. But like, just the subtle twist with her was interesting yeah. and also like it, it is pretty obvious i feel like uh but could have been done up more that cornelius fudge was being controlled i don't think that is really a spoiler and i just remembered yet another topic that's kind of just left out of the movie entirely and that's the the blatant racism that's present in, in the book which is dolores umbridge hates half-breeds so anything that's half, she doesn't yeah. like. You know, she she has a hatred to Hagrid because he's half human, half giant. Uh, she hates. Right. She, there's a right. centaur teacher in the in the books, uh, Ferenz from the very first movie and the first book. He he becomes the professor of divination when Professor Trelawney is fired by the Del- Dolores Umbridge, and when he comes in, huh? Uh, you know, Dolores Umbridge is obviously very repulsed by him she she does everything she can to try to fire him Jeez. but he's he's actually a competent divination teacher teacher so she has no no grounds <laughs> to fire him on because he he's actually good at it <laughs> and i do like that scene where dumbledore comes yeah. out and is like you you can fire them but you cannot banish them yeah. from the grounds it's like this woman lives here Go yeah, fuck yeah exactly and it's <laughs> It is a great moment. It's just like, ooh, here's a little bit of that bite in Dumbledore. You know, it's like we're we're, we're getting to see the the, the fighter, right. the warrior, which we do get to see at the end. It's like I will practice my power where I have it, even though know, you're trying to siphon it away. That racism, though, that we were talking about, that's just gone from the movie. There's a little bit of it near the end, uh, near not near the end, but near Dolores Umbridge's character's end in the story, right. Uh, there's there's just a tiny taste of it but they could have built upon that so well there's there's a lot of message behind this that's just gone from the movie you know right as as i said they hired they hired david yates because he handled political uh political issues in a very un underhanded way you know it wasn't heavy-handed it was just boop there's the political issue we've just slid past it and he does uh, that with the book or with the with this movie. He just slides past these issues. But like, why couldn't it have been a, a political it's wizard? For teenagers, movie? Blake. <laughs> 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 no, I do. I I think that they should have made it way more political. I think they should have dip, dove into the freaking messages that could be yeah be apparent in this. But oh well, the teenage years is where you start to understand and become interested in the political world like at least that's a good time to start otherwise you'll get to be our age and not know what to do in political yeah yeah you'll be so uh, socially inept there's there's so much that this movie could have focused on and so much that was just left out that it's it's just a big disappointment and then uh also I keep thinking of small things I wanted to talk about, which is like there's a there's a there's a line with Professor Moody where he's he's leading the uh, Harry to the train to board, and Sirius Black is with them in dog form, and he he runs Sirius Black uh. runs past Harry like a dog, and uh, Professor Moody's like Sirius, are you barking mad? And I'm just like, come on, yeah, man, yeah. I like. <laughs> use a fucking pun at the time like this like you're you're goddamn serious or like you're kind of crazy and again like, they just kind of make him just like a another comedic character you know what though like though one thing about that is that we didn't actually get to meet his character no we didn't which why so... does harry trust him he doesn't even know this guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, Professor Moody? It's like, no, bitch, you never even knew Professor Moody. <laughs> I, I have never once been a professor. Okay. <laughs> I never really rated it. I give it two and a half stars. Uh, yeah, it's just, it, it, as I said, it's a disappointment. It leaves so much out. And this is one of my favorite books. 
uh, because it was so political. So it's just, damn it. Hear, hear. Safe travels. <laughs> <laughs> and good night. Green and Faceless on the Couch is a proud production of Fiction Works 19. If you like the show, please show your support by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. Like, follow, subscribe, wherever you might listen. We also now have a Patreon account. If you feel so inclined to support us in a financial manner, please become a patron by visiting patreon.com slash greenandfaceless. You can also find more information about us on our Facebook account or on the FictionWorks19 Instagram account. Thank you so much for listening.